morning, everybody. And let us be the first to wish you a very happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers uh, out there. Thank you for tuning in to our Victory live stream on this very, very special day. And before we get going with anything else, uh, we'd like to give a big shout out to all of our teams here at Victory Church for making this broadcast possible, and all the broadcasts, in fact, from our sound team to our editing team to our camera people, all the way through, they, and our worship team as well. We just enjoyed some very powerful worship. Uh, they express the love of God, the love for you, and great courage coming down and doing it right here at the building live so that we can bring you the very, very best of what God has to offer and what he has in store for each of us. So we want to thank all those teams, and I would encourage you to give a big shout out if you're watching online Please give a big shout out. Thank all of our teams that are making all this possible in this very strange time in which we find ourselves, all right? Now, first thing we'd like to do, this is Communion Sunday, okay? We felt like it was a very special day, being that it's Mother's Day, <clears throat> that we want to just thank God for all of our mothers, all the mothers out there, all of you who are watching, um, and we want to thank God, and we felt like it was a very special day, and so we want to honor that day by also remembering what the Lord Jesus has done for us. And so uh, get your, the elements of the Lord's Supper if you're going to participate along with us. Uh, I pray that you're getting ready right now to do so. And so let me please read the scripture out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, in verse 24. The Apostle Paul said, The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So let's go ahead and take our bread and partake together, okay? In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the cup of my new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. For everyone, let's remember that great sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So Pastor Debbie and I, Pastor Debbie and I would love to greet you this morning. We want to greet you. We want to thank you for being with us. Um, so once again, happy Mother's Day. Despite the weird time that we find ourselves in, and the weird year, in fact, I mean, everything seems like it's gotten strange over this year and different. Everything's a first, everything's new, and not necessarily in good ways, but the new normal is not a normal that I like. How about you? And so, you know, yesterday I couldn't help but thinking, it's a very fitting, it's very fitting that in mid-May, we're getting snow in New England. I said, you know what, it's been that kind of year, why not, let's get a blizzard in July. Because it doesn't really matter at this point, um, everything is so upside down, but guess what, in the plan of God, he is working behind the scenes, and what's upside down to us is right side up to him. So you be expecting that coming out of this Tremendously testing season for us all that God is going to bring something great out of the ash heap of life. He's going to bring something great out of, out of something that looks very destructive. In fact, to many families, it has been destructive. But listen, we got to trust God and understand that weeping may endure for this night, but joy will come in the morning, Psalm 30. And so we're going to do that very thing. So today we want to celebrate and honor you, mothers. And the title of the message is Instructions for Young Mothers, but we'll get to that in a second. So whether you are indeed a young mom today, or an older mom, or an expectant mom, or maybe you're a grandmother, and maybe you're a grandmother who's acting more like a mom than the actual biological mother. Maybe you're a spiritual mother or a mentor, and you have that kind of relationship and that level of relationship. Maybe you're an adoptive mom in the sense that you've adopted children. And even though they're not your biological children, that connection is there. Your heart is there. Their heart is toward you. 
And we're going to pray that's exactly the case. And, or maybe you're single. So we like to call you, you're a mother of the future. All right? So whatever state you find yourself in today, we want to honor you uh, today on your very special day. Now, getting back to what I said earlier, we, we've gone with the theme of young moms today because our thought is this. If you can get it right at the beginning when your children are young or correct things that you've started to do unbiblically and you didn't know any better, but whether you do things right from the beginning or correct things in, in, in quick manner uh, because of teachings just like you'll hear this morning, then they're still young enough to where both you and them will not have to live with regrets or suffer loss because of choices that your children may make or maybe choices that you've made that you feel guilt-ridden over in your mind, maybe having contributed toward whatever they're choosing today as their path. Whatever it is, understand that if you're young enough to correct things or start off at the right, on the right foot, please do it and do it now. You have a chance to get it right, so please get it right today. If your children are already grown and out of the house and you didn't know Christ before that or didn't get it right, you can't be crushed with guilt. Lift them up before the Lord. Be prayerful. Understand uh, that you've done, you did your best based upon the revelation that you had and pray that the Holy Spirit would reach them and he would grab their hearts and apprehend them and draw your children close to him, all right? Uh, anyhow, <clears throat> here we go. Let's begin with our teaching this morning, Instructions for Young Mothers. And you see at the top of your sermon notes, by the way, which you can access on our website, you can access on our uh, Victory app, Look at the top of your outlines, Ephesians 6, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul said, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. Boy, this is so crucial, so crucial. Anyone who does not act honorably is going to reap the whirlwind in their life. And the first place that it gets expressed is toward the Lord, obviously, but on a human level, the first place that that honor must get expressed is toward your mother and your father. You might say this morning, I had a terrible relationship with my mother or my father, specifically today, talking about mothers. Well, listen, it doesn't matter if you had a bad relationship with your mother. What is crucial is that you honor the office in which she stands. You honor her position in place of having brought you into this world or having mothered you uh, to whatever extent in your life, despite her own maybe toxicity or brokenness or dysfunction, honor the office. Honor the office. I may disagree vehemently with a politician, um, but I would not go up to them and call them by their first name or trash talk them. No, I will still address them as senator this or president that or congressman that or congresswoman that. Uh, we can be uh, respectful about places of disagreement, but more important, we honor the office. So the Bible says, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. So what's the promise that's attached to living with honor? He said that it may go well with you in the earth and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. There's a severe penalty, severe price that will be paid for living dishonorably, either before God or man, and particularly in this case, with mothers and fathers, and we're talking about mothers today. So, um, if you understand that, you're going to understand it's a very, very powerful principle. Now, I'd like to share um, this with you today. Give me a second. All right, here we go. We're going to go <clears throat> to our shaded box here, right on our introduction. And the introduction, uh, we have three great quotes uh, William Thackeray said, Mother is the name for God in the lips and hearts of little children. I love it. James Faust said this, The influence of a mother in the lives of her children is beyond calculation. And indeed, it is. And then Abraham Lincoln, I think one or two of us have heard of him. He said, All that I am or even hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. So poignant, so powerful. And uh, it, is, it holds true to this day, even in the 21st century, when there's so much disrespect being displayed 
and so much rebellion being displayed and so much toxicity and dysfunction in our uh, family culture in America, which is very sad, but in the middle of all that, we've got to be the church. If you're a Christian today, you cannot go with the flow of the world. You cannot act like the world. In fact, you have to understand God's word will always work. We are supposed to be the pillar and support of God's truth in the earth. And so if we do it right, and if we live right, and if we get this right, for example, in families, if we get our family living and structure and health right, it's supposed to be a signpost to a broken and messed up world that God's way still works, and he's the only one that has the answer. So that's why it's imperative that we get our child rearing right, we get our relationship right in terms of honor and respect, and we get all this functioning right. Because not only does it bless us and it blesses our generations, but also it's a signpost to the world so we can do the work of the ministry, which begins in our home, but then it extends to people around us that we're going to meet. It's very, very important. All right, so let's go to Roman numeral two. And Pastor Debbie and I are going to tag team this message today. We're really excited about that. I don't know that we've ever done it before. Maybe once. Uh, yeah, we've done marriage seminar and things like that. So get ready. Let's go now. God's tips for mothers who are the influencers of generations. You are the influencers of generations. Number one, if you want to get this right, this is a cru crucial tips. Number one, ask God for wisdom and a discerning heart. You've got to ask God for wisdom and a discerning heart. It's very important because even though the scriptures are clear as to what to do as a mother, we don't always know in the spur of the moment how to apply God's truth and, and how to differentiate between this and that sometimes. So we need the wisdom of God, and we need a discerning heart. So look at the scripture, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. Solomon, King Solomon, had a dream, and in the dream, the Lord appeared to him within that dream in, the, in a vision. And essentially, the Lord said, Solomon, I've chosen to bless you. Ask me whatever you want, and it will be yours. So Solomon asked of God, on your notes there, please give to your servant, meaning himself, a wise and understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. Now, Solomon asked the Lord for a wise and understanding heart and for discernment. So he asked him for wisdom, sensitivity, and discernment. But what was his reason for asking? Not that he'd be the most powerful guy in the world, even though he wound up being, not that he would use his wisdom to outfox and crush all of his enemies. Not that he was doing it so that he could own Microsoft. It was so that he would be able to judge and lead God's people uprightly and in a way pleasing to the Lord. When the Lord saw that his heart was to serve the Lord properly and to lead God's people in a manner pleasing to the Lord, the Lord said, wow, this guy's heart is, is for me. His heart is not asking for these things selfishly. So the Lord said to him, because you not, have not asked selfishly, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, I'm going to give you wisdom and a wise and discerning heart and an understanding heart, and I'm going to give you everything else that you did not ask for. So it's powerful. Now, when we talk about discernment or a discerning heart, a discerning heart in the Hebrew language technically means a heart that hears. It's a hearing heart. And so when we say hearing, that means, of one, a heart that's sensitive to the voice and the uh, inspirations of the Holy Spirit, the convictions of the Holy Spirit, the tender, gentle guidances of the Holy Spirit that occur sometimes in a moment of time or right after we've done something right or maybe done something wrong, the Holy Spirit just come and the still small voice deep in our heart and in our mind, sometimes he'll use our conscience, but he he corrects us or he gives us the wisdom that we need, maybe in the form of a thought. Wow, where'd that come from? I didn't think about that. And then we do it and it works. So a discerning heart is something that we need to pray for, moms, because in the pressure, when you're stressed out and the household is upside down sometimes, especially when we're all thrust together like we are right now, things can get chaotic and get hectic and you know, tempers can flare and your nerves can be a little bit frayed. You need the wisdom of God and you need a discerning heart because the Lord will always give us the key 
to the kingdom, if you will, that will unlock situations and keep them from exploding. Now, the second scripture is Proverbs 22 and verse 6, very well-known scripture. And let's read it together. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So then what does this mean? Well, let's look at two key words. Let's look at train, and let's look at way. All right, this word train means to give the child over to the Lord. Because you see in the shaded box, I've defined the word train. It means to prepare someone or something. In fact, its first usages were not in terms of people, but in terms of preparing a sacred building or a sacred space, particularly in the, way, in the, uh, in the manner of Solomon's temple in which that was prepared. And so when we are training up a child, the first thing that training uh, uh, intimates here is that we are devoting them to the Lord. We are consecrating them to the Lord, and that becomes the basis for our training. And so he says, train the, the child in the way that he should go. That means to give the child over to the Lord as Hannah did with Samuel. She prayed for a child. She was barren. She couldn't have children. The Lord gives her the child, and she said, Lord, I pray, give me a child. And if you do this miracle, I will devote him to you. And so sure enough, that's exactly what she did. So when we say train up a child, we've got to, we've got to understand that it begins with devoting that child to the Lord, not idolizing the child, not making a spoiled brat out of the child, but the first thing has to be the heart of the matter, devoting him or her to the Lord. That means to give them to the Lord and to initiate them well into the things of God and to start them off on a particular path in a very spiritual way. So in other words, the first thing we need to do instructionally is not the academics, but it's to incline their little hearts and minds down a spiritual pathway, not an academic pathway. In other words, we're not preparing them at one year old to get into Harvard. Understand the first thing we got to prepare them for is to serve the Lord so that they don't lose their compass heading and go to the world because the end of that way is the way of death. Now, so it means, the word train means to give the child over to the Lord and to incline them down a spiritual pathway. Now, the way, we train up the child in the way that he or she should go means this, that the choices and directions that a person makes in their life are started early on. In other words, significant thought patterns, significant patterns of choice are developed early in life. Habits are set up at an early age, whether they're good or bad. You understand that by neglecting, for example, to do a particular thing with your child or require something of your child, you could be ingraining in them a pattern of thinking that everything's about them and they can do what they want when they want to do it. Now, no mother would want to purposely do that, but you can do that by default if you don't take uh, the offensive posture, go on the offense here, to build them God's way because they're like a little sapling in your front yard. You know, a little sapling is maybe only an inch, an inch and a half in diameter of the trunk, and that's why landscapers have to tie off that trunk. They wrap some rubber around it, rubber hosing. They tie that trunk off. Why? Because the trunk is somebody's character. The trunk is a young child's character. You want to tie it off so that it grows straight and it grows strong. Well, that happens when the tree is a sapling, not when the tree is a 40, 50-foot oak tree. So right now we have the opportunity. So we got to get them making right choices and inclining them in a spiritual way. So the idea of Proverbs 22, verse 6, really means this. We dedicate a child to the Lord and begin to train them in a way that they can understand, but in a very clear way that's biblical, that whatever direction we set a child on early in life, they are far more likely to stay on that path later in life and not radically depart from it. Understand with me that the book of Proverbs is not a book of guarantees per se, but it is a book that speaks of tendencies and possibilities a lot more than it does utter guarantees. Uh, why? Because a lot of Proverbs has to do with, if you do this, the child will do that. Well, understand with me that 
every person has their own free will. Uh, and so a child grows into a young adult and then an adulthood. So they're still going to have to be responsible for the choices they make and the consequences that come with it. But we got to do our very best when they're saplings, tie them off and build them strong. And, when, and the, the odds are that when they're older, they will not depart from the thought process, the priorities, and the agenda of God that you lay into their heart brick upon brick, line upon line, when they're young. All right, that's point one. And we cannot do that without the wisdom of God. We cannot do that uh, without a discerning heart. Remember, uh, a little, little toddler who's a toy-snatching a little toddler will likely become, if not corrected, a spoiled, bigger bully in life. So do it now. All right, point number two. Okay, so number two, just some more practical advice. Never be too busy or too tired for the little things. We know as moms, it's the most important job in the world as far as I'm concerned. As moms, there are so many opportunities to be busy. We can get stressed out. Weariness can come in. Uh, just the, the idea of the fact that there are so many responsibilities that we have. We wear many hats. Some of us work. Some of us work and watch our kids at the same time, uh, especially now, like Pastor said, during this virus. People are home. The kids are home. The moms are home. Um, but there's so many things. I mean, cooking, cleaning, um, spiritual instruction, natural instruction, and then just all the pressures of life, pressures from within, pressures from without. And so we, can, we as moms can ha have the opportunity to become spiritually dull. And we don't necessarily even realize that we have. But spiritual dullness will cause us to miss those moments when we're, when we're tired and when we're dull. And when we're just like, okay, whatever, just whatever you want, just do it, just have it, just whatever. But mom, I just, wanted to, I just wanted to show you this flower I picked. Or, but mom, the, 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 the things that they can say are endless. It's just all different things, but you cannot miss that moment. Spiritual dullness, spiritual insensitivity will lead you to improper instruction and, and not being with them in the moment, in that moment that you should be with them. God is always listening to us. He's always there for us. He's always available for us. So we have to just be very careful that we're plugged into the Lord and that we're plugged into what our children are doing, saying what they're doing at, at all points of time. Let's read the scripture together. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and take shelter in its branches. Matthew 13, 32. A child is like a seed. When you think about it, a seed, a farmer plants a seed, it grows, it gets watered, it gets cultivated, it gets nurtured, but it's growing, it's always growing. And our children are always growing like the seed. They grow when they're sleeping, they grow when you're sleeping, they're growing when you're not paying attention to them. They're growing when you are paying attention to them, and they're growing quickly. Before you know it, your children will be grown, have their own children, be expecting another child, my kids, both of them. <laughs> and, um, and so time passes so quickly. We just have to be so careful and so thoughtful and purposeful about listening to the Holy Spirit so we don't miss those moments of opportunity, moments of teaching, Moments of instruction, moments of love, care, nurture. I know so many times in counseling over the years that we have talked to parents, especially moms, I just can't wait till my kids grow up so I can get on with the things of God. I just want to serve God. I just want to serve God. Oh my goodness, moms, you're missing it. If that's what you're thinking, you are missing the boat big time. Your job is is to shepherd your children's hearts and to be there for them. That is your first family. God's taking care of you. You are taking care of them, and you are teaching them so that when they grow, they can serve him. 
Um, okay. So first bullet point, life's little things always become life's big things. So we talked about moments, moments being like seeds. They're small and they're easy to miss. They're small. If something is small, it can be overlooked. So just, I can't stress this enough, I, and this, which is why I keep saying it, do not miss the moments. Ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, help me. Help me to have a hearing ear, a discerning ear, and let me know when you are speaking to me that my kid is having a moment and I need to be involved in it. Second bullet point, never miss those unplanned for opportunities to teach, to instruct, to model, or to learn from. Those times may be inconvenient and probably will be, can be in the middle of something that you don't want to stop or that you can't stop or that you're involved in. But the fact is, is that those unplanned opportunities are God's interruptions many times. Sometimes you know it's just your kid is lit, whatever, but you can't be saying, you know, no, get out of here. I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. Go do this, go do that. And then they're planning their whole day without even one ounce of instruction or boundary. So um, in the shaded box says, small moments defined. These could be things that you may see, read about, Hear in a sermon, observe other mothers doing both good and bad, or bad, uh, or even something the Holy Spirit may have you over here in a supermarket checkout line. We have all been in these situations where we've, we've read something in the scriptures and the Lord quickened it to us, so that's how he would speak to us for something for our child. Um, I've been, I hear so many things in the grocery store lines, <laughs> or, or just even shopping, uh, which will be nice to get back to at some point. Um, anyway, so a, 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 a mom is standing in a line, and, you know, her kid is like, mom, 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 you know, pulling on her leg, pulling on her whatever. And, and uh, basically she'd be like, what's wrong with you? Stop bugging me. You know, we've all heard things like that. that. And t to us, maybe in our moment of frustration, it's like, what's wrong with you? Don't you see I'm checking out? Don't you see whatever? But it doesn't. It's there's not something wrong with them, but what are they hearing? They're hearing, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? And I've heard a lot worse. That's just one of the little teeny little eensy weensy little things. <laughs> but um, so just talking about a, a, a moment and being there and not being busy and not being tired. Um, my son, who is grown now, Pastor Petey, um, has his own children, expecting another one, beautiful wife. Um, was when he was probably about six years old, we had obviously since he was born, we had the benefit and, and the blessing of coming to the Lord shortly after we were married. And so we, we um, raised our children according to the word of God, biblical principles. So we did have that advantage at that, at that point in time. So my children were learning the scriptures at a very young age. And um, so my son, I noticed that he was, you know, coming. And I was a stay-at-home mom that time, you know, not like going out every day working, obviously, the work of the ministry. But so, so my son was saying, Mom, you know, Mom, hey, Mom, want to come upstairs with me? You know, and I was like, mm, I'm doing the dishes or I'm doing, you know, just because I'm normal like anybody else. And so he was saying, you know, he kept saying, you know, mom, you want to go down? The, you want to go down the stairs with me? I left my, I left my toy down there. Or let's go downstairs. Or let's go, let's go, let's go upstairs. You know, let's play. Let's whatever. But there was something, there was something more to it that I discerned in the spirit because I was listening to not miss those moments. And he was scared. He was afraid. He didn't want to go up in his room in the dark. And most kids go through this. And now. I was a first time mom, so I, I didn't immediately recognize it. I had, it, it, it happened a couple of times first. So, but I, but eventually I was getting the point and I said, I said, Petey, are you scared? I said, are you scared to go up? And he says, yeah. He goes, I sort of am a scared, I sort of am a scared of the dark now, mom. And I said, I said, honey, you don't have to be afraid. I said, you know what, whatever time that you are afraid you can put your trust in God because he is always with you. He's never going to leave you. He's with you in the light. He's with you in the dark. He goes before you wherever you're going. He's holding your hand. 
He is always with you. He's always with me. He's always with dad. And, uh, and he's always with Amy. I'm trying to think, was she born at that time? Yeah. <laughs> um, so Psalm 56, three, I heard him one day. He would, this was probably a couple days later running up the stairs and he had gone down into the dark basement because, and he said, at what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. At what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. At what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. And I heard him saying that, racing up the stairs. And he got to the top of the stairs and he was like, yeah. And, and the thing is, is that that was not only a moment for him, but it was a moment for me because I saw the fruit of my training. I saw the fruit of being involved, plugged in, not missing the moment. I know parents, we can be busy. I know moms, we can be busy and we will be busy, but, but just be listening for if it's time to put something down and actually hear your child. Sometimes you can, it's okay to say, look it, I have to do this. I'm sorry. It's okay. But you have to know when those times are and God will show you. The Holy Spirit will show you. It's not like he doesn't want you to know either. You're not, he doesn't want you to be playing a guessing game. And then also to be plugged in because, you know, as kids grow, you know, all those, all those moments that you don't want to be missing, all those moments as they're little, they, get, they become fewer and fewer and farther between. Trust me, when your kids get to be teenagers, they don't ask a lot. They, they're trying to tell you how you're blowing it, how you're missing it, how you're feeling them, how you don't understand them. You know, for the most part, as moms, we know that. If we've, if we've gone through teenagers. So, so be there, be a voice while they're young, do this while they're young, be in a pattern of this while they're young, so that when they become older, they will not feel like they need to go to someone else because they will take their problems, they will take their conversations, and they will take their moments to someone else. And that someone else could be a friend who doesn't have a good advice, Friends are peers. They're in the same boat. Usually they don't have great advice unless you have a good godly friend. Um, or someone else's parents or a teacher or a guidance counselor or whatever. And I'm not knocking any of them. But if they don't know the Lord, they're not going to probably be giving the best counsel or the best advice for your child's moments. So stay plugged into them spiritually and emotionally. Don't let the moments pass. And remember, their moments can become your moments too, moments and precious memories. So, so don't be too tired. Don't neglect your children. Don't neglect those moments. Okay, great. Point number three. Moms, live with an awareness that your job of nurturing and imparting is ongoing daily. You really don't get a day off uh, because these moments happen, as Pastor Debbie said, and we got to be there ready. No matter what it is, Nurturing and imparting is an ongoing thing that's being expressed by you to your children in a multitude of ways. It's an ongoing thing, and it will go on daily. Nurturing and imparting. Let's read just the first scripture, Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. This is Solomon. And when you see the term, my son, it not only means father to a natural son, but back in these days, it also meant a teacher or a mentor speaking to the student because they would, they would be classified as having almost the level of relationship and, and this kind of thing that a father, a natural father, a natural son would have. So anyhow, it's a very strong statement that he makes here. And look what he says. He said, my son, if hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. For what you learn from them will crown you, crown your life, with grace and be a chain of honor around your neck. <clears throat> now, there's two words I want to point out from this text, and it's the words instruction and law. What do these two words mean? Because the father is seen giving instruction, the mother is seen giving the law. Well, what is exactly does this mean? When we see the word instruction, it literally gives a word picture of a father giving more of a corrective laying down of the house and family rules and then going off to work. But 
The father will set the agenda of the household in terms of rules, regulations, if you will, and how the family operates. Then he goes off to work. But now we have the word law of the mother. You might think, well, the father maybe is laying down the law. Well, not in this particular, uh, by this particular definition. The word law here comes down to meaning this in a practical basis. The pointing of the finger, the pointing of the finger, it means this, a day-to-day -day working out or application of what the father has laid down in terms of principle. If the father goes off to work, which was the case, and it's still the case today in, in many instances, it's the mother who's there walking a kid through being disappointed that he or she was not chosen for a sports team or to make the first squad on the team. Or uh, maybe they fall down, they skin their knee. Maybe they get into a scuffle with a neighborhood child. Maybe they have to forgive someone. Maybe they have to, they've, been, they've been stolen from, and now they have to forgive that person. There's so many instances that real life bring, and it gives opportunity for the, the principles of God's word to be employed. Well, if the father's off working, then who brings the day-to-day -day application? It's the mother. And to this day, it doesn't matter uh, what the setting is in a household. It's the mother that will be there nurturing. It's the mother that will be there saying, that's all right, honey. That's all right. Don't let this get to you. You'll be okay. Obviously, the fathers do it too. But the mothers are the ones that really do the nurturing aspect of things. And so that's why Solomon is saying, here the instructions of your mother, right? Listen to them, but look at what he says the mother. Don't forsake them. That means don't neglect them. Don't leave them behind as you grow because if you hear what your father says, that's great. It lays down principles in you. But if you, if you do not forsake what your mother imparts to you on an applicational basis, that's those two elements of what is exactly what will come together and crown your life with success and crown your life with grace and set you up for a wonderful life. Now, the word nurture means to tutor. It means to educate, but it also means to encourage the growth of someone else, and it means to, to feed and protect, to tutor, to educate, to care for, to encourage the growth of another, and it means to feed and protect. Those are all wonderful, wonderful elements, and those so much speak to me of my mother. They speak, maybe they speak to you of your mother, and every godly mother, this should describe them pretty well. You know, it's interesting, the words that we get, that we can derive from the Latin roots of, of the word nurturing are the, are the, Thoughts today, nursing mothers, nursing homes, all of these thoughts are derived from, the, from those definitions that I just gave you a moment ago concerning what nurturing is supposed to be. Now, here's the warning that needs to come with this, moms. Uh, not just for moms, but let's, let's broaden it a little bit. Ladies, because of God's uh, kind of the DNA. It's woven into the DNA of most women to be nurturers. It's part of God's equipping with a typically strong nurturing desire or inclination. It's frequently in this area, and many, many years of ministry and lots of counseling will speak to this. It's frequently in this very area where well-intentioned females can find themselves operating in a nurturing capacity with a man that they're dating a man that they're interested in or even married to, guess what? That nurturing is out of context there. That nurturing is out of context. Ladies, if you nurture the wrong characters in your life, in and around your life, in fact, then toxicity, dysfunction, and codependency will be the result. You don't want to find yourself changing the emotional diapers of a 30, 40, 50, and 60-year-old person in your life. The nurturing is supposed to be relegated to first your children 
And then second, to any other uh, child or children that God brings in within the context of a healthy impartational setting, not the dysfunctional one that too many women fall into. If you find yourself in that setting, I promise you this, stop it now, start to develop and implement some healthy boundaries, get some counsel about that, get some counsel from people that are not operating in that stuff, get some impartation for yourself to establish some boundaries that are healthy, and then when this, all, when this virus all passes by, please come join us here and get into Celebrate Recovery. Get to your issues because you don't want to live your life in toxicity, in dysfunction, or living codependently because that nurturing, God-given nurturing instinct is misapplied in the wrong context. It will rob years of your life. It will rob the best of your emotions. It will rob the best of your time. And you are not supposed to be emotionally changing the diaper of a grown adult. That, that's, that's an unhealthy relationship. Stop it now in Jesus' name. Let's go to point number four. Okay, so point number four. Um, always be diligent to discipline in the moment whenever, of course, it's prudent and possible. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Moms, you're the first voice of authority in your children's life. And you have that authority that's been given to you by God. So we need to walk in it confidently, and we need to, um, our, our children must learn to obey, they must learn to listen to us as the first voice of authority, because if they don't listen to us, if we don't train them, teach them, discipline them to listen to us, whom they can see, how will they ever listen and obey and trust a God whom they don't see? So we need to, we need to get that right, and we need to get it right quickly. Um, speaking of disciplining in the moment, if you're, if you're a mom today, and if you're a mom that's saying, you know, my child has done something wrong, attitude, rebellion, or whatever, you're going to get it. Do you want to get a spanking? Do you want to have a timeout? You better not do that again next time. Okay. Oh, you did it again. Okay. It's coming. It's coming. I'm counting to three. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. And it goes on and on and on and on. Guess what your voice is saying? Blah, 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 blah. And guess what your child is saying? Now, where was I? Hanging from the chandeliers. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You have, they have to learn to listen to you. Um, years ago, I'll use an, a years ago illustration that's nobody that you would know. Um, we had some gatherings over our home as young pastors, and there was one particular woman who came over with her children, and she actually was doing that and saying that you know, uh, letting her kids do pretty much anything they wanted. They were opening my cabinets and closing them. They were in the bathroom. They were running up the stairs. And, you know, it's very awkward as uh, someone who is not the parent to be instructing the child of someone else if they're in your home. But you have to do it if they're going to destroy your home. But no matter what she said, they did not listen. She had actually trained them to not listen. Because she was saying, you're going to get it. You better get down here right now. I'm telling dad. And clearly she'd been saying that for the first three, four, five years of their lives because they were hearing nothing. And maybe it's cute when they're little. It's not really that cute, but some things are cute. But it isn't when they get older. And, and not only that, first of all, do you want to be that kind of mom that is freaking out every time that you have to go to someone's house Oh my gosh, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? Because you know that your voice holds no authority. And also, the recipient of your child <laughs> is not happy either, and they're frustrated too. And you know what? It's not fair to the child because it's not the child's fault. It's your fault. It's the mom's fault. Or, or, or it's the parent's fault. So um, don't be the mom that you can't take your kids anywhere. Don't let, us be, don't let this be you. Stop it now. It's never too late. Just start right in. It's like if your kids have been getting away with everything, then just say, you know what? Today's a new day. His, his mercies are new. Every morning, great is his faithfulness toward me and toward my child. They're going to listen. Today, they're going to listen. 
Um, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Proverbs twenty two fifteen. You know, children are born, we're born into foolishness. They're born into selfishness. That's the nature of kids. They want what they want. I want this. And they're crying and they're whatever. Why do, why do you think we call them big babies? They're a big baby. They want what they want. They want it right then. They don't care what's happening, whatever. You have to teach them when is the appropriate time for that. When is, you know, whatever. No, Petey, you can't do this. No, Petey, you can't do that. No, Petey, you can't do this. 14, 15, 20 times a day. Hi, Petey. Happy Mother's Day to me. <laughs> Amy was a little more compliant. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm just teasing. But, you know, I've been there. I've been through that. Um, so I, I, know, I know what I'm talking about. Um, so we have to continue to shape our children, to shape their character while they're young. When a crime is not punished quickly, people feel it is safe to continue to do wrong. Ecclesiastes 8.11. So when you're going to punish, when you're going to discipline, you have to do it quickly. You have to continue. You have to do it. You have to stop what you're doing and do it then and there. Three hours later, 10 hours later, wait till this happens or wait till we get home or whatever. It's, it, it doesn't have the same effect as if you can discipline in the moment. Obviously, if you're in a store, you're not going to spank your child. You're not going to give them a time out. But I have left full carts in the grocery store. I have said I'm going to buy you a present and I have left without the present. Yes, did I enjoy the crying all the way home? Nope. But guess what? The next time, when I said, you better stop, they stopped, except for Petey, a few more times. <laughs> um, so discipline differs from punishment. Discipline comes from the word disciple, who is one sitting at another's feet and learning. So it has the idea of loving instruction, but it makes you responsible for what you've done wrong but then along with that, it reshapes you and gives you life skills to make better choices down the road. So, so it's, 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 it's discipline. You can have a punishment within it, but it's to a better end, whereas punishment has a limited value and it doesn't really reshape you. So what we're doing is we're reshaping our kids. We're, we're, we're putting boundaries in their life. Boundaries are safeties. They're safeguards. Boundaries are safeguards. Think of a train on a track, okay? How fast that train can go when it's in the proper boundary, when it's, in the, when it's on the track, it can go. A horse, bridled, can go where it's supposed to go, not run off a cliff, not a train off the tracks, whatever. It will, it will go how it's supposed to go when it has the proper boundaries. Think of a puppy. Think of a little puppy. You know, you, you, you create your animals um, to keep your house okay when you're not home, <laughs> to keep them from going rampant and uh, destroying everything in the house. And some kids have tendencies to do that. Others don't. But they, a puppy will feel secure. They have what they need. They have the boundaries. They, they cuddle up into the corner a lot of times, you know, pressing up against something because it gives them a feeling of safety. And it's the same thing with the kids. They can be screaming and crying and whatever, but they're thankful and they will, especially when they get older, they will look back and be thankful for those boundaries. I know my mom had told me for when I was a teenager, she said, listen, if you ever get in a situation where you feel uncomfortable or you, you know, want to want to do something and then you realize this is not what I want to do, she says, you can just call home. She says, call home. And, and I don't care what you have to say, just say, I have to go home. Call me and say, make up anything you, ha you have to, just get out of your situation. And that did happen to me, and I won't get into the story. But, um, but I had that, I had that safeguard. I knew that my mom was there, ready to help me to do whatever she could when I got in trouble. And so as you get older, those boundaries, they're going to keep you safe. This boundary came in a form of my mom saying something to me, but there's a lot of other ways that we create and we put boundaries in people's life, in our children's life. So keep the boundaries, ladies. 
All right, let's go. We'll finish up with point number five. So let's look at our outlines together. Here's the fifth point. Live wisely before your children and always strive to model what you want them to remember most, not least. Whatever you want them to remember most, strive to model that on a daily basis. You can teach them what you know, but you will ultimately reproduce what you are and what you model. You can teach them what you know by reading a Dr. James Dobson book, How to Raise Children, okay, uh, but you can read them some instructional stuff, but what they will remember most is what they see modeled. If they see a mom and dad yelling and screaming at each other and whoever yells the loudest wins that argument, then they will they will internalize that that's the way conflict resolution needs to take place. If the silent treatment is the order of the day that they start to pick up on between parents, then they'll realize that whoever gives the silent treatment the longest wins the battle. And so whatever you want them to model, model that, I'm sorry, whatever you want them to remember, model that very carefully each day, knowing that you know, well, you're always on call. You don't get a chance to let it all hang out, so to speak. You've got to stay in the spirit, and you've got to stay in the anointing, stay in God's grace, which is all sufficient. Yes, we're going to blow it, but stay in the grace, stay in the anointing. And look at what the Apostle Paul said. Philippians 4.9 says, Keep putting into practice, he told the Philippians, all that you learn, notice the words, and all that you received from me, everything you heard from me, and everything you saw me doing. So you see all the various contexts were of life where Paul is bringing their remembrances back to. What you heard me teach, what you overheard me tell someone else, this, that, and the other thing, but what you saw me doing is the final thing that he puts into the box because it's a crucial piece. And he said, if you will do all those things, then the God of peace will be with you. Now, the reason why Paul uses all of those uh, activities, what you learn from me, what you receive from me, etc., is because someone can be a good moral parent, but if they're not operating by the principles of God's word, then the only thing they'd be able to tell their child, let's say in, if they were writing this verse is, and whatever you saw me doing. Because if they were to have said, for example, whatever you received from me or whatever I taught you, well, what if half of what they taught them was not biblical, but it sounded good? What if it was moral but had no spiritual components to it all? For example, someone who's purely moral without the spiritual underpinning and biblical underpinning to it has really no basis for their own morality because morality is an outworking of spirituality that has a fear of God at the end of the pathway. Because if I have a fear of the Lord, that means I have a spiritual base. Out of that spiritual base comes a sense, an internal intuitive sense, that there's an accountability to a higher God that I'll have to answer to in terms of how I live. But if I don't put God in the picture as the basis for my morality, that's why so many people are engulfed in moral relativism. This, this parent teaches their kids this way. This parent teaches their kids that way. You know, and they're all good parents in terms of teaching their kids, okay, you be honest, don't kill people, this, that, the other. But if God is not in the picture, that morality has no realistic basis, and it will not stay, in most cases, with those children because it's not tethered to something greater than the mere instruction. That's why Paul said, you've got to have all these factors, and then the God of peace will be with you. He didn't say financial success will be with you. That's immaterial. The God of peace needs to be with you, or none of that stuff's going to matter. So, ladies, moms, these are the final thoughts that we want you to draw from, and that's why we put these down so you can look at them and look at them again and ask the Holy Spirit to help you with these. Ready? Number one, put God first in all these things. Put God first, rather, in all things, every day. You put God first, and your kids will pick up on that. You put God's la God last, your kids will pick up on it. Um, Proverbs 20 and verse 7 really speaks to the fact that this is what will bring blessing to our children. Look at these scriptures. Look them up in your own time. Number two, model a healthy fear of God for your children. 
If you don't have a healthy fear of the Lord, a healthy respect, a healthy reverence for the Lord, uh, your kids will not either. But the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 26 on your notes, that when we do that, the fear of the Lord creates a refuge for our kids. Next. So next. Be honest, even about your own self, using wisdom, of course. So be honest. If you've blown it, if you said a bad word, if you lost your temper, um, anything basically that the Holy Spirit would convict you of, you know when you've said something wrong, you see the reaction of your children, especially if they're teenagers and you let your guard down. Um, so just, you know, be honest and repent quickly. Use wisdom. You don't have to say every little thing that you did or said wrong, but you'll know the Holy Spirit. You ask the Holy Spirit, we'll show you. Um, and that's Proverbs twenty-eight thirteen. Also next, always teach and demonstrate a good work ethic. Proverbs twelve eleven. Model servanthood for your children. That's who they're going to learn from. They're going to learn from you. Model servanthood. Have them come to the house of God with you. Have them come to the church. Have them, have them, have them work. Have them serve. Have them do something. Have them serve in children's church. Um, serve your serve your neighbors. Serve the elderly. See, teach them. Um, give them chores to do, cause them to be responsible. And uh, just really quickly, um, a good illustration of this, and there's been many over the years and many more besides this, but I think of Ray and Kelly Vasso and their children. They have done well teaching their children to serve. They're always here. They're out. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're always helping someone, and their kids are right alongside of them. They are modeling that behavior of a good work ethic, and especially for the Lord on, on top of that. So, Okay. Now we're going to go to model submission to spiritual authority. If you don't submit to spiritual authority, like the Bible says, then your children will not either, and you're going to be setting them up for spirit, to be spiritually rebellious uh, is very, very important. The, the reason why we submit to spiritual authority is that we can live blessed, uh, accountable lives. And when we live accountable lives, our lives are being lived out in the light, not in the shadows. Uh, that's why it's a no-go for a Christian to try and be a Christian without having a local church family and local church leadership to be accountable to. Because then you're serving God on your terms. That's not going to work. It's unbiblical, it will fail you, and you will open yourself up to deception and ultimate destruction. So teach your kids, oh, no, 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 the house of the Lord's important. We love our pastors, we submit to, this is where our lives are rooted in, this is what we do, period. Next, teach your children to honor spiritual leaders. Over the years, we don't ask this, we don't demand it of people, but some kids will walk by and say, hi, Pastor Pete. And some kids will just walk by. Now, I know it's not always the parents' fault, but I'll tell you what, when the parents train the children right, why doesn't it extend? If you're going to tell, if you're going to uh, address your teacher as Miss So and so or Mr. So and so, uh, then listen, or Coach So and so in the sports teams, then teach them, Pastor, uh, Pastor Pete or whomever it is. Teach them to address people respectfully because that will bring them honor as they so honor, okay? Watching out for your children in the long term. Teach them. We live in an age right now where this is not being done a lot. I mean, there's an incredible spirit of rebellion in our age. Don't let your child become a victim to that because you don't enforce and impart the right things. It, you'll be the one that will reap the dividends. Okay. Love the house of the Lord first, not your schedule. We have to model importance by attending and serving regularly. We have to model that for our children. If we don't put a priority on, on uh, serving and coming, um, putting the Lord first, we are not going to have our children do the same thing. They won't either. If we don't, they won't. So what's important to us should be taught and trained and will become important to them. Um, also, uh, never let your children hear you gossip about others. First of all, you shouldn't be gossiping anyway. But if you are, don't let them hear you. 
Um, it's sin. It's wickedness. It's an abomination. I learned so much in children's church um, in the early years of what every every child's parent was gossiping about because kids just say anything and they'll tell you what their parents are talking about. And lots of times there was roast preacher at the dinner table after church and it was just very interesting. And we learned early on um, how to help parents to understand that their kids are doing that. And why are they doing that? They're doing that because their parents are doing that. So also gossip, it stirs up strife. It separates friends. It does all kinds of wickedness, evil, and we don't want to we don't want to be responsible for having trained our children in gossip. Next two, we're going to finish up here. Always treat motherhood with dignity and proper responsibility. Remember, responsibility, I mean gravity. It's not a light thing. That's why it's so disastrous when a teenager has a child, when their own life is not developed, their own future is not developed. And then when they bring a child into the world, you know, you have a child essentially raising a child and things can get into a total mess. And so there's gravity, there's responsibility. Why? Psalm 127 verse 3 there in your notes says, children are a gift from God. They belong to him. They're the heritage of the Lord. He lends them to us, but he watches to see how we train up what belongs to him. They don't belong to us. They're lent to us. Next, give your children the greatest gift. You know what that is? Love your spouse in front of them. If they see a husband loving his wife the way Christ loved the church, if they see the wife loving her husband in front of your children with honor and respect and, and submitting to the headship in the home, uh, assuming that it's godly and biblical, guess what? The children see, uh, they see that operating and they say, oh, this is how we do a relationship. We can lovingly disagree. We work things out. But love and order and blessing fill the home. The anointing and grace of God fills the home. And children say, I love it. I remember when our kids were little, with them going to a couple of other homes just to play for a little while. And they came back and said, man, that house, they're fighting all the time. This house is just so cold and sterile. Even though I got invited over to play, it's cold, it feels cold and sterile. There's nothing there atmospherically that we have going on in our house. See, our kids, that, that young, picked up on the atmospheric shifts. And so will your kids. Set them up with blessing. Last. If you're a single mom, trust God, get proper counsel, do your very best, and never hide behind worldly excuses and he will give you the victory with your children. Being a single mom is tough. It's tougher than having both parents there. And God knows that. So get the help you need. Don't be afraid to get counsel. Don't be afraid to reach out and get help from other moms, from, from uh, uh, other leaders in the church. Um, and don't hide behind the worldly excuses of, well, I'm a single mom. It's too hard. It's too hard to bring my kids to church. You know, by the, I don't have anybody helping me get them into bed at night and, you know, have to get up early in the morning and I'm tired and whatever. Like I had said before in the previous uh, point, don't be too tired to do what is necessary. You have got to, you have got to, to bring your kids. You have got to impart the right things. And if you're a single mom, get the help that you need. You can do it. Um, and you can't hide behind those excuses because those excuses aren't going to really work. I think of Rosa Tuca, who has raised her three sons, beautiful, beautiful, godly men, and she did it alone. She did it alone. When it was time to pray, they were up and praying. When it was time to serve, they were here and serving. When it was time to do devotions, they're doing devotions. So it is possible, and look to those examples. Look to those people. If you're in this church, you know Rose. Look to her. She's got a lot to offer in the, in the, in the mothering sense. So we're going to close now with our concluding verse on your notes there, Proverbs 23, verses 24 and 25. Parents rejoice when their children turn out well. Parents, you want to rejoice? Work at it now. Wise children become proud parents. Make your father and mother happy Give your mother a reason to be glad. 
And mom, your children will give you a reason to be glad. They will turn out well. They will serve God if you do the right thing now. However inconvenient and however difficult, do it, commit to do it, get the help you need to do it, and the God of peace will indeed be with you. Moms, we'd love to close out in prayer and pray a blessing over you on your special day. So let's do that. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to pray for every mom here, every grandmother, every expectant mom, every adoptive mom, every spiritual mom, and every single person who is a mom of our future. Father, we pray a rich and mighty blessing upon their lives. Lord, may they be healthy. May they be strong. May they sense your wisdom and your grace upon them. Give them a wise and discerning hearts. Let them never mis, uh, misuse their nurturing inclinations in an unhealthy or dysfunctional way. Let them help them, Lord, to be strong, to erect boundaries, to live within those boundaries, and to do the right thing, Lord, and you will bless them with every good thing, and their children will not be a thorn in their side, but their children will be a crown of grace and blessing that will come back and touch their lives in a special way. And then the blessing will go on generationally with what gets put in motion today. Bless the women of God on this special day, Lord. We can't do it without our mothers. Thank God for our mothers. Thank God for Christian mothers who are holding the standard of the Lord in this most ungodly and dysfunctional generation. May the women of God be empowered by your grace uh, and by the Holy Spirit of God. They can do all things through Christ who will strengthen them. In Jesus' name, Lord, amen. Ladies, amen. happy Mother's Day. We love you. We hope and pray that you enjoyed this teaching. And uh, if you like it, share it with others. And just one last thing. I wanted to say happy Mother's Day to my mom, Joan Buses. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Love you. Okay, on that note, we'll conclude. Thank you for being with us. Again, share this with other people, and we thank you for being with us today. Happy Mother's Day. Thanks for watching. We would love for you to do two things. First, click the logo and subscribe to our channel. And second, like, comment, and share our videos with those whom you care about. We're always updating our page with the latest messages and original content. Thanks for watching.